talking about Mendel. So Mendel was um, a very, very imperative in this whole process about uh, learning about heredity. So let's start with just talking a little bit about your traits. So many of your traits, including the color and shape of your eyes, the texture of your hair, and even your height and weight, do resemble those of your parents. You don't look exactly like them, but you do resemble them in some ways. The passing of traits from parents to offspring is called heredity, and we can thank Gregor Mendel for that process. Um, he was the gentleman who discovered all of this stuff. So long, 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 long time ago, um, Gregor Mendel, he was a monk in Austria, and he decided he wanted to do some scientific study of heredity. So he was actually the first to develop all the rules that we know about today. Of course, they have been changed a little bit with our new, um, new information about DNA, but for the most part, the patterns and the rules that he predicted are still in use today. And we'll see some of those as we go through this particular uh, video. So all of these patterns and these rules that he discovered form the basis of modern day genetics, which is the branch of biology that focuses on heredity. So we can actually thank Mendel for all of this stuff. So he actually started working with garden peas, and there's some varieties, different varieties that he found. So there's several traits that he worked with, and he noticed that some had purple flowers, some had white flowers, some had different colored pea pods or pea shapes. So he discovered that he wanted to kind of experiment with this to cross-pollinate to see what was really happening in this situation. So he experimented with these garden peas by cross-pollinating plants with different characteristics. So what do you think? If Mendel crossbred these plants here, we have the one on the left, which is a tall pea plant, and he bred them with a short pea plant on the right, what kind of offspring do you think there would be? So if you said that there would be a 100% tall plants, then you would be correct. So by breeding tall and short plants, Mendel discovered that most of the time they would be tall plants. And we're going to run through his experiments so you can kind of see what they were. So Gregor Mendel did this step, or this experiment, pretty much in four steps. What he started with in step one were a variety of garden peas that he allowed to self-pollinate for several generations to make sure that all the offspring would display only one form of that trait. So for example, we have here in this picture, we have purple and white flowers. So by cross-pollinating and making sure, uh, or, or not, I'm sorry, not cross-pollinating, but self-pollinating, Gregor Mendel made sure that all of these had purple flowers and all of the other ones had white flowers. He wanted to make sure that they actually did have the correct color. He called this the first, or the P generation. This is the first generation to have two individuals that crossbred in the breeding experiment. And this was very important that he found this and he let them cross-pollinate because he wanted to make sure that he had some pure plants, which is called pure bre or true breeding here. In two, Gregor Mendel cross-pollinated two P generation plants. So what he did is he actually made sure that he pollinated a purple flower and a white flower. So this is something that he did himself. And once he did this, the offspring that came off he called the F1 generation, which is called the first filial generation. So our first generation that we have, the one that self-pollinates itself to make sure that we have pure colors, this is your P generation. And then we have our second generation coming from the P generation. This is your F1 generation. Now, if you notice here, 
all of those flowers were purple. So when you crossed purple with a white flower, all the colors came out purple. So your F1 generation in Mendel's experiment came out purple. Now for step three, Gregor Mendel decided that he wanted to self-pollinate the F1 generation. So these purple plants that came off the F1 generation, so remember, these are the ones that are right in here, he decided that he wanted to let them self-pollinate. Once he allowed them to self-pollinate, he found that the F2 generation, which is your second filial generation, this generation came out with a very different type of ratio. And you can see it here. There's actually three flowers that are purple and one flower that is white. So your F2 generation typically comes out in a three to one ratio. The three typically has more, I'd say, more of the dominant color. So this is the one that in the F1 generation, the color that was here was the only one represented. Now notice in your F2 generation, that same color is the one that is mostly represented in a three to one ratio. So let's just go through the steps just one more time. This is kind of exactly what he did, just in almost the same picture that you saw before. So our first generation, this P generation, he allowed them to self-pollinate for several generations in order to get them to be of the same color. So when they pollinated over and over, they were exactly the same color. This is known as true breeding here. So we have all purple plants here, all white plants. Now in this P generation, he took a purple plant and a white plant and then he produced the F1 generation by pollinating them himself. And what he noticed was that they were all 100% purple plants. So the F1 generation came out 100% purple. In the F2 generation, he then allowed the F1 generation to self-pollinate, and then he found that the offspring from that generation, which is the F2 generation, came out in a 3 to 1 ratio, three purple plants and one white plant. So this is the basis of Mendel's experiments. So what he did here, he did something called a monohybrid cross. And think of the word mono, mono means one. Hybrid means kind of like a mixing of a couple things. So he did a monohybrid cross which is a cross that involves one pair of contrasting traits. So for example, the colors. So we have a purple flower and a white flower. You can also, let's say, plant uh, or cross a plant with a yellow flower and a plant with a blue flower to see exactly which one is dominant in that case as well. So remember the results that he came up with, that the F1 plants only showed one form of the trait, which was purple. And when he allowed this F1 generation to self-pollinate, that missing trait reappeared in the F2 generation. And that ratio came up to be three to one, which is really important to remember. So do remember this, three being the dominant trait, if you will, and white being the not dominant trait. So in his theory, when he was coming up with some of his results and his conclusions, he actually correctly concluded that each P has two separate heritable factors, as he called them. And he determined that there's one from each parent. So when the gametes, which are your sperm and your egg cells, form, each gamete receives only one of these traits. So some of the gametes, let's say during meiosis, one gamete will get the purple trait. But if there had been some white traits in the past, then it's possible that a gamete also gets that, well, in place of the purple, will get the white plant trait. Now during 
um, for, during fertilization, when a sperm and an egg cell come together, those two factors will again come together, one from each parent, and those factors are called genes. So these genes are actually, basically, they're, they're traits. These are the inherited traits from parent to offspring. And remember when Mendel was doing this, this was all back in the 1800s. So there was no DNA discovered back then. He did all this just by pea plants. Now, if you remember back to meiosis, Let's take a look here. We have your, your body cells, remember? So your body cells have two forms of a gene. It might have, um, in this case, if we're talking about dogs, the big B stands for black hair for a dog, whereas the little B is brown hair. So in this male body cell over here, it has two big Bs, meaning that it is basically the dog has black hair. Now during meiosis, what's going to happen is that this is going to split so only half of that DNA gets passed on. Because remember, if we do the full amount of DNA, then the organism is not going to be the true organism. So we have one big B and one big B in separate gametes. So each of these represents one sperm holding one big B only. So same with females too during meiosis. Now this female body cell has two little bees, meaning that this dog now has brown hair. And during meiosis, what happens, we get half the DNA in each gamete. So now each gamete only receives one of those versions. And then when one male sperm and one female egg gets fertilized, we now have a new puppy. And the new puppy has a big bee from dad and a little bee from mom. And now this puppy is going to have black hair because it appears that black is dominant from this little key. We'll do more of this in class in case that's a little confusing for you. <clears throat> now to wrap things up, Mendel actually came up with four hypotheses from his experiments. And these now make up the theory of heredity, which is the foundation of genetics. And remember, he had no DNA back then to kind of fall back on and say, oh yeah, it's all DNA. Mm -mm, he did all this with just pea plants. So his first hypothesis for each inherited trait, an individual has two copies of the gene, one from each parent. We just kind of went over that in the last slide. So you get one version from mom and one version from dad. So mom and dad's egg and sperm cell when they come together forms the zygote. His second hypothesis was that there are alternative versions of genes, and he discovered this with pea plant color, height, um, pod shape, pod color. So there were a couple different things that he noticed. So it wasn't just the flower color. So he um, determined that there are alternate versions of these, and so today, we call them alleles. He didn't call them alleles, but we do today. So alleles are the different versions of a gene, and they could rest um, on the chromosomes, but they have you know, different versions. So when we're talking about height, we might have different versions of those genes, or color of your hair, or weight, things like that. His third hypothesis, hypothesis he determined that there was actually, in those two forms of the genes, one was dominant over another. So when two different alleles occurred together, one of them was completely expressed, the other one was not expressed. He described the expressed form of the trait as dominant. And this is why today we typically have that as, a, uh, as an uppercase letter. <clears throat> The trait that was not expressed when the dominant form was, he called recessive. And this is why today we typically have it as a lowercase letter. So dominant means that the version of the gene is expressed, whereas a recessive trait typically is not, not, uh, not present if the dominant form is also present. 
His fourth hypothesis, I think, probably was more exciting to know about, especially without DNA and understanding the principles behind DNA. So when gametes are formed, the alleles for each gene in an individual separate independently of, enough, of one another. So this basically means that in the sperm, there's only one version of the gene because it was separated way earlier from the body cells, basically before meiosis. So he discovered that only one of these versions contribute to fertilization. How? He still didn't know, but he knew that the process was taking place. So each sperm cell only had one version of the gene. It did not have both. And those gametes then carry that information to when they get fertilized. So the baby only has one version from each parent. 